Before you further, we would like to start this off on a positive note. We want to sing happy birthday to Willa Mae Spencer, who uh, this time last year was traveling somewhere in Africa, am I correct? Oh, trying to get to Kenya? Where was it anymore? No, it was Swaziland in South Africa. Swaziland in South Africa. I, I get to go to Coney Island, right? <laughs> okay, ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Willamay. Happy birthday to you. Okay. The good, the good news is all the ladies are here. Let me tell you back there, I, I, I'm telling you. I know what they say when it's cheaper by the dozen, but a half a dozen is even cheaper. So, uh, you're going to see one of the most magnificent performances today of talent we have right here in the capital region, all right? I, I had the awesome pleasure of performing with a lot of these ladies in uh, a couple of productions we've done, like the Color Girls or uh, Blessed Group, the Billy Holiday play. And by the way, some of our Legends of Legacy members here happen to be actors and actresses. Um, let me see, who do we have here? Is that Paul Hacker? Yeah, no, Paul. Paul just completed a part as Sergeant Schreiber in Freedom Summer, and he was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> he tried to join the New England accent, but then Paul slipped on the ice and broke a rib. I said, don't go to New England too much. We don't go. <laughs> And Paul was also in uh, Raising in the Sun. Yeah. Okay, and he played he played a priest that baptized Billy Holiday when she was in reformatory school last year. So Paul Paul started out with us right here in the audience at Legacy Legacy and is going on to become one of our best actors. Okay? We also have you know, I said Willow Ray Spencer was here, but did you know that Willow Ray Spencer does part time work as a nurse? Oh <laughs> She was Billy Holiday's nurse last summer. She had a friend that wanted to go out to Coney Island and put on her bikini. And shake her money maker. <laughs> so there we go with that. Okay. Uh, I'm down with the Soul Man Hyman, and uh, this is our second installment of Whispers, Words, Wisdoms, and Woes. Our first one was two years ago for Women's History Month. And uh, Deborah was part of that. And she read to uh, California Cooper's a passage about the uh, rain coming from over the head, right? Yeah, we celebrated African American women in the diaspora. Uh, Bessie Head from South Africa, Jamaica Kincaid from the Caribbean, and California Cooper from the West Coast. So, quite a few people in the audience today that I know that are stars. Uh, we like to welcome Anastasia Robertson here, who's a the, our premier dancer, the church was dancer in the capital region. And she did a, a thing with us last year about uh, Benny Lou Hamer that was, people still talking about it. They're still talking about it. It was absolutely marvelous. They had, they scared them. They came out with a cross and was a, did, did a whole Ku Klux Klan thing. Hey, they wasn't ready for that, these church folks, you know? <laughs> I told them they'd be burning churches down, you better be ready for it. And um, we have a special treat here. Um, the Legend of Legacy, ladies members, this is Women's History Month, so I did something for you. Okay, I know that you got your birthday gift, right? Oh, you're welcome. Okay, no problem. Give them a hand, please. Are you ready? 
like to salute those ladies who have been here before and we've done programs about. And so we'll let you know what they had to say when they were here. Okay, first I would like to introduce you to uh, something written by Naomi Sims. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I have always felt that one great advantage of being both black and a woman was that I started off with nothing to lose. is working on her doctorate dissertation. Okay. Her performances of civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer are a gem in the history of black people. L.D. Campbell. My palette was all dark colors, 
but next to each other the dark tones of red, green, blue, brown, and gray came alive, no matter how subtle the nuance. Faith Bingo. Okay. Sharon De Silva spends her time being an attorney and in her leisure time enjoys writing an upcoming book that she will soon publish. She shares with us her righteous love for theater, having performed in For Colored Girls. Wow, it's not good. Oh, no, it's here. Um, 
The first poem I want to share with you is called Who Are You Going to School For? Let me tell you who I'm going to school for. A lot of times when we're doing something positive and constructive with our lives, people are always saying, well, why are you doing that? You know? Why are you doing this? Like, you know, why are you supposed to be doing it? So I was asked so many times because as I worked, and I worked when I was younger, we had to work. We couldn't go to college. We had to buy clothes. We had to help. My mother was a single mother after a while. We had to help out. So we got to buy our own little pleated skirts and our own shoes. And of course, my first wig. I mm -hmm. <laughs> and the rest of the money I gave to my mother. So, um, because when you're doing something positive and constructive, people always ask me why. I wrote a poem I want to share with you. It starts, who are you going to school for? You ever thought about it? You thought I was just going to school for myself? No, I'm not that selfish. Let me tell you who I'm going to school for. I'm going to school for my mother, who was only able to obtain an eighth grade education. Then committed to raising her children. I'm going to school for my father, who was only able to obtain a third grade education. But he created one of the biggest, largest black-owned businesses in this Albany town. He called himself I'm your friendly guardiologist. <laughs> his education was limited in the business field, but his business one day came to an end. I'm going to school for all those in the past who could not go. I'm going to school for all those who died for me to go. I'm going to school for all those who marched for me to go. I'm going to school for all those who prepared the way for me to go. I'm going to school for all those who continues to push me along. Each day I step into class, I step in with a mass of people. I step for Harriet Tubman, Harriet Jacobs, and Olada Iquana. I step for Sojourner Truth, Phyllis Wheatley. I step for Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois. I step for Marcus Garvey and Richard Wright. I step for Lansing Hughes and Ralph Ellison. I step for Malcolm X and Octavia Butler. I step, I step for Janad Diaz and Louis Van Des Los Benditos. I step for all those who stood strong even in their death. I step for the movers and the shakers, the legal teams. I step for Martha Luther, Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, and others. I step for my educators, and many, many more. I step in class with Dr. Sutherland, Black Psychology. I step for Rebecca, Phoebe, Betty, and Carrie Ann. Phoebe right there. <laughs> I step for my brothers, sisters, children, my grandchildren, and all families. I'm going to school for those for all those who want to go. I'm going to school for all those who try to go. I'm going to school for my ancestors. I'm going to school for those to come in the future. I'm going to school for you and for me. But most of all, I will always continue. Thank you, God, for this poetic commitment. The next poem I'm going to share with you is a poem I wrote um, during Obama's inauguration um, at State University of Albany. And I read it there because we had a big celebration. What we did was we sent some people to Washington. And um, some of us stayed at home to carry on the celebration, of course. So um, this is the poem I wrote 
you dedication for the being a father. A dream fulfilled, so long deferred, has come to pass. Oh, what a glorious day this is. Glory, glory, hallelujah. We are starting to see the dream, Martin Luther King Jr. You can hope steadfast, it arrived much sooner. Oh, beautiful, my country, to the thief. We are united with a plea. This vision was foreseen by those with much earlier dreams. Harriet Tubman's Railroad, the North and the South thought about it. The pioneers, movers, and shapers wrote about it. Equality and justice was shaken about it. Longevity blew horns and beat drums about it. Sacrifices and bloodshed maintained it. War and confrontations ingrained it. Intolerance and superficial differences fueled it. Disrespect and hatred could not cease it. At last, he comes, tall, lean, and erect, standing firm with dignity, affirmation, and with a mission. The man of mutual respect. That's right, Barack Obama, coming on a 180 degree angle, planning to construct a full 360 degree circle. To the right, to the right, to the left, to the left. <laughs> I don't think so. Let's try the middle. That's right. We can fiddle with the middle. Yes, we can. I come to help all of you turn it around. Yes, we can. That's right, President Barack Obama. At last, at last. A historical moment has arrived, not for some, but for all. Oh, America the beautiful. You look so good to me, and I'm hard to please. Obama, Obama, Barack Obama. Father, you would have been proud. Mother, you saw me off and on my way. Mother, your struggles were not in vain. Mother, your sacrifices were greatly Game. Mother, because of you, I am the one who became the dream. A dream so long deferred and thought impossible. But if one believes all things are possible, yes, Mother, I am talking about the impossible dream so long deferred. But Mother, a dream that has come to pass, not only for the both of us, but for also the man. You see, Mother, all those who blazed the earlier trails knew I was on my way. Oh, Mother, you have helped produce such a great day. Obama, Obama, President Barack Obama. So much can be said about this awesome day. As we, be as we become familiar with the very humble man who came our way, day by day, gathering up composure, steadfastness and unshaken firm ground <coughs> to study and balance itself at every earthquake and unfriendly storm. Through some areas, though some areas were gray, dark, and bleak, he kept a keen eye on the vision up ahead. Don't bother me with all that superficial, subjective criticism. Give me an equal chance and I will erase all America's prior isms. I know of a greater importance that involves our future generations. I stand corrected for all my faults being in a perfect creation. Though so my concentration is on present issues and future thoughts, yes we can, I know. Don't you know that we can? It is time to readjust, rebuild, and re reequate ourselves once again so we can move forward to greet each other at the crossroads. Hold each other's hand in unity, yes we can, to create new strategies, reinvent the true meaning of brotherhood and sisterhood. Oh, America the beautiful, this is a time of newness, a time for cooperative structure and functionality to motivate as a unit of human dignity. Humanity is the promise. Yes, we can. Yes, President Barack Obama. 
Martin Luther King saw the glory of his coming. Although King had went on, President Barack Obama, he salutes you on. Because he knows that you can. Yes, you can. Yes, we all can. And yes, President Barack Obama, I had a dream. A dream so long deferred has come to pass. A dream fulfilled has come to pass. Yes, we can. I know we can. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Mr. Obama, for birthing our country's dream.
in the history of black people. L.D. Campbell.
I was overjoyed at the tremendous positive support that I received as I traveled throughout the region, pointing out the benefits of census to our community. I had never had a job that had so much fun doing. I had so much fun doing. Thank you everyone, young and old, not-for-profit organization, college, public sector, and private sector organization for contributing your help. Antoinette DeLauro. Lady T is a writer, poetess, and actress who shares the wealth of her talent as the Lady in Purple in Procultor. <laughs> and as Harriet Jacobs from A Narrative of a Slave in the Underground World War production of Harriet, 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 and Harriet. <laughs> is one of my favorites and was published in Mr. Lavalot's classic <coughs> magazine and I beg Teresa to read it for me today. Okay. <laughs> Before we begin, we'd all like to ask you to remember that we're dedicating this particular program, Women's History Month, to our sister, our mentor, and our great inspiration, Miss Annette Lavalot. Dedicate Lady Little Roddy Whispers, Words, Whispers, and Woes, Part 2, to Miss Annette Lavalot. We were truly blessed by the faith she had in us, and we will continue to press on, inspired with all the love and support that she gave us unconditionally. She missed one month of our advertisement for our program, and the next month she put us in for Martin Luther King. Here we went from 12 to 5 showing uh, different programs about the civil rights movement, Voices of Civil Rights. When I opened up Classique Magazine to look for the ad, she gave us a full page. <laughs> okay? Now, that's the kind of woman that she was, and we were nobodies. We just were trying for days. Mm -hmm. And she loved us in that kind of a way. When we were at uh, the Moon and River Cafe with the Billy Holiday's place, she was the first one sitting there at the cafe in the front row waiting for us and always having articles about us in our magazine. So we do her honor by being here. She was like a journalist and a writer, and you ladies are definitely carrying on that, that torch. As they say in Africa, uh, Makola. I'm going to take a piece, a piece of fire from my fire and pass it on to you and let you light your own fire. So you girls fired up. <laughs> Because 
when you're doing something positive and constructive, people always ask me why. I wrote a poem I want to share with you. It starts, who are you going to school for? You ever thought about it? You thought I was just going to school for myself? No, I'm not that selfish. Let me tell you who I'm going to school for. I'm going to school for my mother, who was only able to obtain an eighth grade education. Then committed to raising her children. I'm going to school for my father, who was only able to obtain a third grade education. But he created one of the biggest, largest black owned businesses in this Albany town. He called himself, I'm your friendly guardiologist. <laughs> his education was limited in the business field, but his business one day came to an end. I'm going to school for all those in the past who could not go. I'm going to school for all those who died for me to go. I'm going to school for all those who marched for me to go. I'm going to school for all those who prepared the way for me to go. I'm going to school for all those who continues to push me along. Each day I step into class, I step in with a mass of people. I step for Harriet Tubman, Harriet Jacobs, and Olada Iquana. I step for Sojourner Truth, Phyllis Wheatley. I step for Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois. I step for Marcus Garvey and Richard Wright. I step for Lansing Hughes and Ralph Ellison. I step for Malcolm X and Octavia Butler. I step, I step for Janad Diaz and Louis Van Des Los Benditos. I step for all those who stood strong even in their death. I step for the movers and the shakers, the legal teams. I step for Martin Luther, Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, and others. I step for my educators and many, many more. I step in class with Dr. Sutherland, Black Psychology. I step for Rebecca, Phoebe, Betty, and Carrie Ann. Phoebe right there. <laughs> I step for my brothers, sisters, children, my grandchildren, and all families. I'm going to school for, those, for all those who want to. I'm going to school for all those who try to go. I'm going to school for my ancestors. I'm going to school for those to come in the future. I'm going to school for you and for me. But most of all, I will always continue. Thank you, God, for this poetic. Longevity blew horns and beat drums about it. 
sacrifices and bloodshed, maintained it. War and confrontations ingrained it. Intolerance and superficial differences fueled it. Disrespect and hatred could not cease it. At last, he comes, tall, lean, and erect, standing firm with dignity, affirmation, and with a mission. Demand a mutual respect. That's right. Barack Obama, coming on a 180 degree angle, planning to construct a full 360 degree circle. To the right, to the right, to the left, to the left. <laughs> I don't think so. Let's try the middle. That's right. We can fiddle with the middle. Yes, we can. I come to help all of you turn it around, and yes, we can. That's right, President Barack Obama, at last, at last, a historical moment has arrived, not for some, but for all. Oh, America the beautiful, you look so good to me, and I'm hard to please. Obama, Obama, Barack Obama. Father, you would have been proud. Mother, you saw me off, and I'm my way. Mother, your struggles were not in vain. Mother, your sacrifices were greatly gained. Mother, because of you, I am the one who became the dream. A dream so long deferred and thought impossible. But if one believes all things are possible, yes, Mother, I am talking about the impossible dream so long deferred. But Mother, a dream that has come to pass, not only for the both of us, but for also the man. You see, Mother, all those who played the earlier trails knew I was on my way. Oh, Mother, you have helped produce such a great day. Obama, Obama, President Barack Obama. So much can be said about this awesome day. As we, be as we become familiar with the very humble man who came our way, day by day, gathering up composure, steadfastness, and unshaken, firm ground, <coughs> to study and balance itself at every earthquake and unfriendly storm. Through some areas, though some areas were gray, dark, and bleak, he kept a keen eye on the vision up ahead. Don't bother me with all that superficial, subjective criticism. Give me an equal chance and I will erase all America's prior isms. I know of a greater importance that involves our future generations. I stand corrected for all my faults being in a perfect creation. So my Concentration is on present issues and future thoughts. Yes, we can, I know. Don't you know that we can? It is time to readjust, rebuild, and re reacquaint ourselves once again so we can move forward to greet each other at the crossroads. Hold each other's hand in unity. Yes, we can. To create new strategies. Reinvent the true meaning of brotherhood and sisterhood. Oh, America the beautiful, this is a time of newness, a time for cooperative structure and functionality to motivate as a unit of human dignity. Humanity is the problem. Yes, we can. Yes, President Barack Obama. Martin Luther King saw the glory of his coming. Although King had went on, President Barack Obama, he salutes you on. Because he knows that you can. Yes, you can. Yes, we all can. And yes, President Barack Obama, I had a dream. A dream so long deferred has come to pass. A dream fulfilled has come to pass. Yes, we can. I know we can. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Mr. Obama, for birthing our country's dream.
and I designed the cover because my publisher couldn't get it right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the name, this is a short poem. The name of this poem is Mama is my name. But my son usually be here with a little with a little drum behind it. So I brought some of this music. It's called Mom is My Name. <laughs> Mama is my name. Nurturing is my game. Young ones hear what I have to say. I promise I won't take up much of your stay. Mama is my name. Nurturing is my game. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you must stop killing, cutting, and beating one another. Begin to act as a blood brother. Her pain and anger is killing your individual nations. Let's come together with love and exercise our patience. Yeah, mama is my man. Nurturing is my game. My final rap, message for wisdom. I give to all the youth because I see a positive vision. Embracing one another with love. Respecting each other's manhood. Protect one's families and community. Upholding another's trust. Don't sell yourself or your family short of a dollar bill. Yeah. Mama is my name and nurturing is my game.
it's not too late. We can still reach out. We can still lend a helping hand and, and change what needs to be changed. It's the teachers alone, the principal, the social workers, they, they can't do it all by themselves. They have to really come to us with that foundation laid and then we can build on it. But if we're trying to lay the foundation from 8 to 2.50, whatever time the bell rings, we're just going around the same mountain. And I, it was a pleasure speaking with the other authors and folks that um, in the room here. And I'm really going to try to see what I can do to get them into the school because They, they need to hear this. It's true. It's not just what the ministry books. They sometimes don't like to see the books. It's a turn off to them sometimes. But a forum like this, they would embrace it. And it is still educational. Right. <laughs> I just want to share with you briefly. This is my first book that was published in Fusion on the Farm. Now this is my copy. This is my copy that I use when I do my reading sessions. The one for purchase is much smaller. <laughs> and I have some back there. I, I wrote, and this is something that I know other authors will agree with. You don't always write and then take it to the publisher tomorrow. I wrote this book along with some others and found it ten years later when I was moving. <laughs> <laughs> I started writing when I had my first child and I have read to all three of my children from the time we could sit. And when we couldn't sit, I would cross over the pillows. And they would go tumbling all right and I'll put them back up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, it is very important if your children are not into reading, when they come to the classroom, it's hard for us to get them into it. Uh -huh. And if you don't read, it doesn't matter how pretty you are, how tall you are, if you cannot read, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. When I look today at, for example, a contract, and we have an attorney here, no one wants to read a contract. What do you think of these entertainers? They're doing so well, and in a couple of years, they're broke. You say, wow, what happened? <laughs> That's because they don't like to read, and they did not read the contract. Now, if we don't train our children to read, they're going to be in trouble. Because the person who can read will come up with a scheme, and they know they're not going to read it. They will explain in words. He said, what is this I'm signing? Well, you're just signing that you agree that we will do this deal together. Oh, okay. But that's not what you're really signing. So reading is very important. And once we get children to love it and encourage them, it brings us to start early. Mm -hmm. And that's why I encourage each and every one of you, if you have children, grandchildren, it's never too late. What I do with my children, I might have them read to me. I said, I'm, I'm tired today. Let me sit on the sofa and you can read to me. Or as I'm doing the dishes, I'll give my daughter to you with the book to me. That's both we need. Well, if you know, I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I will write more towards some of the things that Shirley, um, Sheila, or Sheila was um, presenting in her, in her form. It's very entertaining. I talk to Mr. Hyman every day, every day. Sometimes we run from each other because <laughs> we will talk and talk and talk and not really do our job. But nonetheless, he's inspired me to 
to write a book as I shared my childhood memories with him one day. He said, that would be a great book. And I, I accepted that, and I want to share something with you. Like he said, it's still in progress, so this is just a rough draft, which by the time I'm finished, I will see it a little bit. So I'll just share with you. Anyone here like so, <laughs> one, one of the things that is such a pleasant memory, as a child, we had new fruit trees, and if we didn't have one, the neighbors would have one, <laughs> our family member down the street would have one, so we didn't have to run to McDonald's and uh, to the corner store a lot because there was always a fruit tree somewhere around and that fruit was in season. So as I was sharing that with him a few weeks ago, I got this idea to write about mangoes and I love mangoes. It starts with the mouth watering memories of last mango season, thinking of the sweet ones, the really big ones, the fresh ones, the sour ones, the overripened ones, the green ones, the ones half eaten by the birds, the ones who are tasty to the birds. I love the fleshy mangoes with perfect skin, no black spots, no soft spots, no broken skin. One big bite into it would fill my little mouth and make my taste buds jump and shout. The second bite would cause my eyes to close while I swallow the juicy mango, I would wiggle my toes. <laughs> but before you get to sink your teeth into a delicious mango, you must wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. Waiting for the mangoes start with the bees. To pollinate the blossoms, they fly from tree to tree making buzzing sounds that echo through the leaves. It's hard to ignore those busy, busy bees. So you hurry by with caution, trying not to bruise your knees. The weeks go by, and so do the bees. It's easy to see that their work is done, and everyone knows that the mangoes will come. But still, I wait, and wait, and wait. Now, this, this idea is that, as a child, I, and there's more, I'm not finished yet. I, I, we didn't have a mango tree. Our neighbors did. And the land was sloped so that when the mango falls, <laughs> it's going to roll over on our side. Now, as children, when it's mango season, you would go to the market with your parents and you would see mangoes. You would say, wow, the mangoes in my neighborhood, you know, where are they? You know, they're taking forever to it to come. But it was such a, it's such a delicious fruit that we just couldn't wait. So we would actually watch the mango tree from the time the blossoms were <coughs> on it. And um, a lot of times, the first two or three mangoes are no good. <laughs> So it would wait and wait and, you know, it would fall and it would be rotten or worms would be off because you have to really wait until the whole tree um, was ready. But this is my next book that I will be working on mm -hmm. and I hope I'll get to share it with you guys again and I know that it's the that you can't wait to get it again on the finished product.
background on Long Island. Um, I'm appreciating some of the older uh, traditions, the southern traditions, uh, more and more like the older. Um, just really, really appreciating how uh, the things that we used to do as black people, that you know, years go by, and we see less and less of. And we started complaining more and more about, you know, what our people are not doing. And we used to do it, didn't we used to? Or, and now it's just more and more important. Um, um, but we do come from a, a rich culture and history. And I'm you know, now getting to the point of really appreciating that I need to learn more about it and um, and draft it before it slips through our fingers because sooner or later we're not going to have the luxury of it. So whenever we get a book or whenever I find something um, that's regarding our people, I'm like, okay, I'm scoring away at this point. Because uh, it may not be as easy to get or keep as time goes on. So anyway, this book, like I said, is about loving us and just appreciating the work of our culture, our heritage, our tradition, just the, the flavor of us um, as I get older. So um, to start with, I want to give homage to black women. Black is a uh, women six months. Um, I'm giving homage to black women in particular. This poem is called Aunt Jemima Child. Now I know some people think Aunt Jemima I'm <laughs> not sure I'll take that, you know. So, um, well, this particular poem was inspired because I was living, I was living on hall, a drunk drunk hall, and I was a white uh, girl. She said, how do you look like Aunt Jemima with that head rag on? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I didn't react to it, but I thought about it. It's like, so this is that poem started for a for me. Aunt Jemima's uh, Child, a poem for aunties and nans everywhere. Said with a nasty attitude. Hey, you look like Aunt Jemima with that handkerchief on. I see a specter, a round, deeply chocolate face looking at me, while she quickly sucks on a ham hock bone from a bowl of green <laughs> and stands over a kitchen sink and out her own. And yeah, she has a bright blue and yellow rag on her head. Done, she wipes her mouth and stands straight. In her own land, she would have worn colorful clothes of her people's design, learned of love and strength and dignity from all her relations around her. Gone through a rite of passage and married a man of the much like her own. Raised proud daughters and honorable daughters, who ate foo -foo and braided their hair and danced to be a drum. Constant, heart reviving drunk. Perhaps in time, she would have sat and smoked pipe with the elders. Here, she worked hard and to catch any light in a dark kind of world, where her very skin is her mark of property. Forced to bear any and all of her whitewashed world kingdom, regardless of her job. Long hours, days, years, and no love for her to call home. Although she's mother of many children, only to see them go. Had to let them go. Still she smiles. Don't cry for me. My children live. My children live and I live in them. So, if you see a smoking blue shade shimmering in the kitchen, don't worry. It's just she hanging around a familiar place, choking the smoke on tobacco for the children's hit. Don't worry, she isn't lost. Don't you know she is the one still frying the catfish and working the grits and gravy? See her apron swaying to our music? May not know the lyrics, but she still recognizes the beat. Don't you know? We her children are still living the spoons around her first hot pot of stew. And if she holds and open the door today for us to come on through. What? Because I don't raise no fools. She delivered the kings and queens. Only to rebound the tools, re relearn the tools, rerun the paces, retake our places to reascend and rule. 
again and again and again. See, I just saw her yesterday. She was yawning time again, as always, to give her children love. Today, she smokes her degrees and passes out warm bread love, but it was loose and hugs in 50 minute chucks. You see infinite possibilities in her eyes. I remember the plan singing to you, and now you will survive. You say, hey, pass me some black eyed peas, and I'll turn up some Al Green and dine. So they know quite like an anti-mama party. Because she is, we are. The original rock and roll. Okay? And we don't stop, and we don't stop, and we don't stop. I 
me every day and get no less decree. No extra judgmental season required for me. You and the four L's above bring all the flavor needed for what you call me. I'm just giving my way. I is who I am. I'm, I is who I be. I be who I be. Life, love, logic, and law, and harmony. The sea destiny. Truth, eternal. Internally. You feel me now? <laughs> Because it's only because of his grace and mercy that I'm here with you today. 
as I had overdosed on the heroin when I was young. Okay, so I do keep it real, all the way real. Um, right now we're dealing with suicide and violence in Schenectady County. I am a part of that um, community that's trying to prevent the violence that's going on in Schenectady right now. Um, I empower our children by giving them information about community agencies that are available to them in their community. Um, I'm the one that walks the streets. Um, I, I have to be out there. I believe that God put it in me to be a soldier. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we gotta we gotta please our own. You know what I mean? Um, right now I'm in the process of starting a task force where we can stand on the corners of the streets and mediate and intervene in violence. Um, I believe in what I'm doing, the cause. Um, the first poem I'm gonna write is called Father. And it's a funny poem. Um, because, you know, I wrote it, and I never had a father. I don't know my father. Never seen him, don't know him. But I wrote this poem to empower our black men on how to be a father. I could not remain in the church anymore. I could not stop crying and felt that I did not want to live, that I wanted to die. And I know my brother would have been disappointed if he knew I felt that way. I asked my mom if I could walk down the hill to our home. She understood my pain and said, okay, and gave me a big juicy hug and I left. During my sleep, I had a dream which really seemed like a vision because it seemed so real as though it were really happening. It was about David. He came to me and told me that he sneaked out of heaven because God was sleeping. He said that he came to me to tell me not to worry about him because he was fine and he was in heaven with God. He told me to be strong and to always know he's at peace and that he is happy because he is with God. He said that he could not stay too long to speak to me because God would be looking for him. And if God awoke out of his nap, he did not want God to worry about him or to be concerned about his whereabouts. I awoke from my sleep, which seemed so real and instantly felt better. I was content knowing that my brother was not really dead, not dead at all. He was alive and living with God, his real father in heaven. Several days after David's death, my mom told the family that it was a miracle that she was able to love my brother one more time before she got it. She said that she was at home in Harlem and that when she came home one day, she went into the bedroom to rest her tired seven months pregnant body. She changed the clothes and laid on her back to rest. She said she noticed that something was moving in the life picture which hung directly over the middle of her bed. She did not understand how anything could be in the life picture because it was in the middle of the ceiling above her bed, a good distance away from any of the walls. When her husband, Marlon, came home, she told him to please check the fixture. When he checked it, he was surprised it was a dead rat which was infested with maggots. And that is why she saw things moving. They were both shocked of belief, of not, of belief not knowing how a rat landed in the fixture. My mom then told Marlon to please not hit, let any of the maggots fall into their bed. Because she did not want to feel any of them crawling on her body late at night, mom spoke with four thoughts. That night while she, while she, while, that night while sleeping, she felt something crawling on her leg. She was upset to know that some of the maggots ended up in between her sheets. She instantly felt the urge to go to Trinidad because she instantly knew that something was wrong. She could not explain a sudden desire to go to Trinidad, knowing especially that she had not paid for such an unexpected trip. She quickly raised her pregnant body and awoke Marlon and explained to him that she must go to Trinidad. Marlon told her to call home to Trinidad to seek assurance about him with him, but she said, no, I must go. The father of the bar is telling me to go home and I must. That was a Tuesday night and she arrived in Trinidad on Thursday and was blessed to know that the Lord gave her sign to reach home before the death of her only son, David. She knew that if she had not come home and the maggots fell on her, that she would have missed the opportunity of enjoying her son. She would have missed his life, his love, his total being before he turned to ashes, before he returned to God. My mama was not the only one who received the sign of my brother's death. I too had a spiritual encounter a few weeks before his passing. I have to cut it because it, that was like, yes, time is flying. Um, that was the day, I'm sorry.
Later on that night, I was sleeping on my bed and suddenly woke and began looking out into the living room when I saw my Auntie Marcia walking and behind her, I saw the most beautiful, peaceful looking white woman that I have ever seen in my youngest years of living. Her hair was the richest color black, her shoulder lengthy, her shoulder meant shiny black curls were neatly arranged on her shoulders. This woman, this beautiful woman, had on a long, sparkling white dress. She also held in her hand a black and white composition notebook, which was open and had names written in script, name after name, written almost halfway down the book. In her hand, she also held a blue big pen. I just sat in amazement for a period of time. I don't exactly know how long. I then decided to ask Auntie, who was the lady walking behind her? And she said, Maddie, darling, what lady are you talking about? I said, the one that is walking behind you, the white lady. She said, there's no white lady walking behind me. And then asked me if I was okay. I suddenly jumped out of bed and ran to her. I don't know where the white lady went, but she was not behind my auntie when I reached my auntie's warm arms. Auntie held me tight and took me to the kitchen, and that is when I saw the table filled with fresh homemade loaves of warm bread and other baked goods. Auntie was baking bread. She sat me down at the small brown kitchen table and then she sliced one of the warm loaves of bread and spread some butter on it and placed it right under my nose. She told, she told me to tell her what I had seen and I did. She then told me that I had the gift, that I was blessed with the gift. I asked her what gift? She said it was around 2.30 in the morning when she heard a knock on the front door and ran over to open the door while asking who it was because it was so early in the morning and we never had any visitors at 2.30 in the morning. She said that she opened the door but didn't <coughs> see anyone. So she closed the door and had returned to her baking. Auntie said she heard two more knocks on, on our door and that every time she opened the door, no one was there. She said that she then took a, a break and it began walking around the living room just thinking about life and that was when I awoke asking her questions about the white lady. When I enjoyed, while I enjoyed Auntie's delicious bread, she told me that I probably saw an angel and that I should never be afraid to see spirits because it is a gift from God. She said that many people, especially spiritual Baptist people, would love to have seen what I saw. And she said that my great grandfather had the gift of seeing spirits, even during the daytime. She said that when he was 10 years old, he saw spirits walking around the earth like humans. When I asked her how my great granddaughter knew that they were spirits and not humans. She said that he knew and would tell you if he saw them. I was terrified listening to my auntie. I did not want this so-called gift. I don't want to see anything that is not human. She realized and must have seen the fear in my eyes and she pulled me into her arms. I sat comfortably on her lap and she hugged me and told me to never be afraid that God has blessed me with a beautiful gift. Besides, she said, Prob probably, you probably saw an angel. I hardly slept the rest of the morning because I was greatly afraid of seeing more spirits. I stayed awake for about another two hours and finally slept, slept after praying to God and to Jesus to please take this gift away from me and to give it to someone else, maybe my auntie. That morning, I was the last one to someone finish. That morning, I was the last one to raise up and saw that no one was in the house, no one, I was alone. The house suddenly felt hot, very hot. When Auntie suddenly came into the house and said to me that the house seemed unusually very hot, even for Trinidadian weather, and that everyone was outside relaxing. It must have been 10.30 in the morning, the house never felt like 90 degrees, even when it was 90 degrees outside. When I left the house, I carried and walked to the front yard, walked over to the big tree next to the house, the same tree that David fell out of when he had a seizure. I looked down the hill and saw two spiritual Baptist women coming up the hill. My auntie must have seen them as well because she ran over to me and said, there are two spiritual Baptist women walking up the hill. And if they come close to our house, I will call out to them to tell them to come over to you so that you can explain to them what you saw last night. The women came close and close and I saw that they were both big brown women. They had white glasses and skirts and their heads were wrapped with white pieces of cloth. And he called them over to me and I explained the white angel to them. They both held my hands and told me that I was blessed of seeing such a wonderful image. They said that only a few are chosen to be blessed to have such a gift. I asked if the woman I saw was bad or good, and they said that she was an angel, that her purpose would be revealed to me soon. I was finally happy to at least hear and really receive confirmation that my white lady angel was a good angel, and when the spiritual Baptists left my home and began their journey up the hill, I was at peace with my soul. <coughs> I'm almost done. It was not until my brother's death 
exactly two weeks later that I realized that the white lady was truly an angel and that she came to add my brother's name in her book, or should I say God's book. That is why she had the black and white composition notebook with the many names listed on it. She came to add my brother's name to her list. And now my brother David is in heaven with God and in his good book.
go, where you throw something at me? <laughs> they go, people need to get a clue. And think about some of the stupid things they do. Before it's too late, soon we'll be entering the perfect gate. Don't get any better yourself before you're just the memories on someone's shelf. We should have more love for life. Love your children and do what's right. Less destruction of mankind. Search your souls and see what you find. Things may seem unreal. There's nothing wrong with telling people how you feel. Mm -hmm. If you feel your soul is too deeply hurt, pray to the Lord for your rebirth. Mm -hmm. If you still don't understand, keep on talking to the many people. Mm -hmm. My big brother, my uncle, my cousin. It was like he was, I, he had me. So he, he this is crazy. But I love the son. And this is called the point is, and this is one of the metaphors that I tell to young children when they be outside doing crazy stuff and not being mindful of their own self. So I, first I named the model is, but I changed it to the point is. And it goes, you didn't make me, you can't break me. I'm beautiful and intelligent, you can't take me. I'm God's child, so you hate me. I stand in the name of Jesus, don't mistake me. I understood Dr. King, Dr. King's dream, he wouldn't want to debate me. Malcolm X made the people stress. He went to jail, came home, changed his life, and life around, and became the best. Mandela spent a lot of time behind bars for the rights of his people to be starved. Farrakhan wanted the people to see. All he wanted was equal rights for his country. Jesse Jackson had the people scratching. He spoke the truth and made the world stop laughing. Mm -hmm. Al Sharpton did the marching. Stabbed and placed in jail because he wouldn't stop talking. Here you have Obama. What he's saying is save the drum. This should tell you something about karma. He's hot, his words are like lava. A volcano eruption. He wants the people to stop the self-destruction by doing away with corruption. It's time for a change. Stop the violence in memory of Katina Thomas.
by Derek West. What Derek West did was give up his life in order to take someone else's. The message is, don't be free and be dumb. Mm -hmm. Give it a, give it a, excuse me, a heartfelt thank you to my Uncle Noel for, the, for believing in me and keeping me encouraged to believe in myself in the way no one else did. Just like Rashawn, you was my rock. Thank you, Uncle Noel, for helping me make at least one of my dreams come true. I love you. Rest in peace, Bass. Stop the violence. Any any plan or or, or uh, order or this was just a miracle. This was just a miracle. And a blessing. Would you ladies please stand up? Because I want to get a shout out how pretty you are. Okay. God only knows. Face the camera over there. One more.